with uh, Good Morning. I hope everyone's having an amazing uh, DrupalCon so far. Um, just a show of hands, has anyone heard of Drupal 8? Okay, awesome. Really glad you guys have heard about it. I know there's been a lot of great um, talks from Dries yesterday throughout the con, um, and today I'm really, really excited to share with you guys some of the adventures that we've all had um, up on the stage in launching um, mskcc.org, Memorial Sloan Kettering's um, brand new website on Drupal 8 um, several weeks ago. So um, we're super, super excited to be here. And uh, my name is Molly Burns. I'm an account director with Phase 2. And um, I've had the pleasure of working with this amazing team. Um, so just to introduce um, the folks we've got, we've got Evan Liebman, who is the director of MSK Digital, and he's been the uh, product owner and champion of this project. Um, Jacob Rockowitz is the Drupal CMS consultant for Memorial Sloan Kettering, who um, is also known as the developer extraordinaire, as I like to say. Um, from the Phase 2 team, um, we've got Jonathan Hedstrom, a software architect, um, also our man in core, um, who's been working on unblocking a lot of amazing uh, Drupal core blockers that we had and doing a fantastic job. Um, and we've got Brad Wade, a senior front-end developer at Phase 2, who did our Drupal theme architecture. And um, from Digitas, we have Jill Baker, a principal creative engineer who worked on the front end and the design process. Um, so super excited um, to uh, get started. And um, hold on. Um, I wanted to start with um, introducing Evan, who's going to be talking about some of the processes that um, the MSK's team went through to choose Drupal 8 and um, their design process. And um, all right, awesome. Okay, so just a little um, background on MSK. Um, so MSK is a, is a cancer center um, located in New York City. Uh, we have a singular focus, which is conquering cancer. Um, and Molly mentioned we just launched two websites in Drupal 8, um, mskcc.org and sloankettering.edu, and that was a leap from V6 to V8. Um, our adventure began, um, well, I'm going to talk a little bit more about sort of the digital strategy and um, a little bit more of the strategy around why we chose Drupal 8. And, these folks here are going to get very technical for you, but um, just to start, just to give you the background, um, our adventure began in April 2014, just about a year ago, um, and we selected two agencies to work on this project, and many thought that we were crazy, but uh, we decided to split the business because um, you know, we chose Digitas LBI for, for the creation of a digital roadmap and strategy, um, as well as the design and UX um, and strategy for, for the two uh, redesigns. Um, and by, by April 2014, uh, we had done some prototyping of uh, migration um, from V6 to, D to V8, and we knew we wanted a technology partner uh, with experience and being an early adopter in Drupal, so we selected phase two. Um, so just a little bit about, uh, about this process of developing the digital roadmap, um, looking to create uh, meaningful digital experiences for, for our consumers. Um, and so today's healthcare consumers are involved in decisions about care and treatment of themselves and their significant others, and healthcare providers are expected to interact with patients and other medical professionals uh, in, in digital environments. And we, we weren't quite there yet. So, um, you know, we, we set out to, um, you know, um, to deliver um, these desired digital experiences through MSK's digital space. Um, and in doing that, we, we began this development of our digital roadmap. Um, and so um, the first part of the first rollout of our digital roadmap are the redesigns of mskcc.org and sloankettering.edu, a huge project but a small piece of the pie. Um, so other, other projects that we'll begin working on are um, pre-care tools, customer relationship management, in-hospital tools. So a lot of work to be done and, you know, it was a great project and we got the sites out there. Um, but this is part of a, you know, a, a larger holistic vision um, to enable MSK to, to better serve its core audiences. Um, and, you know, presently our digital face um, to the world are, are very distinct sites. Um, we have um, six major sites that are, that are out there, um, external facing, um, and we're not all aligned with the same, you know, you know, we don't have unified assets, we don't have shared code libraries, um, we're all on different platforms. Um, so this is part of the, you know, a bigger project that, that we'll be working on this year um, and into next year to, to align everything. 
Um, so I'm sure many of you are familiar with Journeys and Personas when we first started this process. Um, we, we, we developed um, these Journeys and Personas of, uh, of seven, seven people here um, that are frequent visitors of our website. Um, and I'm not going to go into detail at all about this, but just you know, understanding a prospective patient from the point of diagnosis to survivorship and what are all the digital touch points really helped us understand that strategy work helped us to understand what these what tools were necessary. Um, so you can please go to the websites and, and check them out. This is um, they're they're live now. Um, it's been a week. It feels like two weeks. It feels like two months. Uh, but it's only been one week. Um, and so this is this is our homepage. Uh, very simplified. Very focused. Very direct. Um, dive right in. Are you a patient and caregiver? Are you a healthcare professional? Are you a researcher? Um, one of our um, landing pages for those segments um, really simplified the approach. Um, within these pages, but also the number of templates. I think we're down to like nine templates now um, on the website. Um, this is one of my favorite templates. Uh, it's the tile template. We're going to talk quite a bit about this in, um, in the, uh, the technology portion of this presentation. Um, and this is the home page for sloankettering.edu, also using um, a tile template. So I've been getting this question quite a bit um, since I've got here, and I uh, figured I'd come right out and, and answer it. Um, so why, why did we choose Drupal 8? And um, it was it was actually a pretty easy decision, um, um, and and it, these three um, decision um, this, the decision was based on these strategic pillars of MSK innovation, financial sustainability, and talent recruitment, and um, we have a culture of innovation at MSK. Um, we have a relentless um, commitment and unmatched expertise um, that that results in breakthroughs in patient care, uh, research, and education, um, and there, there's lots of similarities. Um, to the Drupal community there, and we'll talk more about that uh, tomorrow in a session. I'll, I'll tell you more about that in a moment. Um, from a you know a perspective, the financial sustainability perspective, uh, we didn't think it was really viable to go from V6 to V7 um, and then to V8 because we we wanted this all the work that we had done into um, developing the personas and the journeys and the strategy work. We don't we didn't want to do a two-year redesign. We want this to be a long term. Uh, perhaps five years, and so we thought if we um, if we launched last month, um, two, sorry, last week, um, in, uh, in in Drupal seven, we'd be talking about Drupal eight redesign right now, and you know, moving to Drupal eight and perhaps doing another redesign. So um, you know, we need to be financial stewards, and 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 we just didn't think it was it was worth um, the money. Um, so um, also, I, for me, this is the biggest um, um, decision maker with with talent recruitment. I mean, there are there are folks who. Who are doing work in Symphony and object-oriented programming? Who are not here right now? Um, they are, you know, that's that's their focus, and they don't even know that Drupal 8 is coming and available for them. And I think that 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 really helps to widen the talent pool uh, for Drupal, and um, that makes it really exciting for us. Um, so, um, just one, you know, one final thing: when we when we set out in um, April 14th to do this, because I mentioned that there was a lot of pre-work in, into moving to Drupal 8. Um, and that was all pioneered by, by Jake. Um, and Jake, you know, he came in to um, talk with us back in April of 2013, and he had this mantra, you know, V8, don't be late. Um, and it really helped to drive us and, and get us focused on Drupal 8. Um, and so um, we'll talk more about that. That was a little echo. Um, yeah. I, I, um, Start on the first slide. This is what I'm going to talk about, and I, I brought up prototypes because um, every project I have worked on in my career has started with a prototype. Just to be clear, like even custom CMSs, just proof of concept. Um, to get Sloan Kettering to Drupal six, I did a proof of concept, and and one thing to say about prototypes is it's trying to address the biggest concern of the project. And for Drupal six, for example, I only ported their doctor profiles over because that was the biggest selling point. Because Sloan Kettering is about finding a doctor. And when I did it, views made it very easy to create a rich filter template to find doctors. In Drupal 8, and I'm going to jump past to the next slide about prototyping, is in Drupal 8, the key thing was proving it could be done, that you could take a 30,000 nodes and move them to Drupal 8 and have an admin UI that works. And uh, what was kind of amazing is um, the migration, which I'll get into more detail, just I got it down to about a 30-minute migration when we were prototyping, where we could just bring over all this content and just show it working, show the menu system is working. Um, there was no theme. It was just the Bardic ad – basically, it was Bardic and admin UI. It just showed that you could navigate the site. Also started showing key benefits to the content maintainers. 
to see the responsive design working in the admin UI, to see the improvements in the node edit form, to see CK editor in there, and stuff like that. Um, this project, the migration that I set up started in with Alpha, th Alpha 3 in uh, 2013. And um, one of the key things when I was doing the prototype was also just to get the scope of the problem. Like, what was the gonna be the real problem of moving to Drupal 8? Um, and I think everyone who, especially coming from Drupal 6, when you're looking at functional programming and you look at Symfony, it's overwhelming. Um, so I had to do a lot of just learning Symfony. I, I mean, my recommendation is learn Symfony. Do a week of just doing a Symfony s prototype um, and you'll throw it away. Um, that, that was another thing I kind of had to con make it very clear when we were pursuing this project that I, I spent 25% of the code written was thrown away at some point. Because you're just moving ahead, things change in core, you've got to rewrite things, you've got to change things. Um, and and the, the other biggest thing, because it, it's like chasing head, testing is, to chase head, you have to have testing for all your custom code. I, there's no other way to do it. If, because what's gonna happen is some API is gonna change or there's gonna be some regression. And the only way to see it in your custom code is to run some tests. You can't run through every single line of code you've written to see that it works especially when it comes to into back-end integration with third-party APIs. Um, and w I mean, I was new to testing. Drupal 6 really wasn't pushed because simple test was a, a contrib module and wasn't in core. Um, the biggest benefit I found was like a certain level of comfort with the code I was writing. Like when we went live, there were certain APIs I didn't have to think about because I ran the test and I was like, it's working. It's integrating properly with back-end systems like clinical trials. Moving to the next slide. So uh, just about the migration, this is important. There, I don't know the status of the migration in core, but when we started the project, Migrate Module was just like a twinkle in Tree's eye. It was just announced that they were going to bring it into core and have a migration. And it wasn't really a viable approach to be chasing head and chasing the migration path. So I went with a custom migration. Um, and I actually did something. I've done a lot of migrations from one system to another. And one thing I did is I did the opposite of what I've always done, which is in the new system, you write this massive migration that pulls in data. And I realized in the prototype that D8 was just not stable. And it's, you know, now it's a lot more stable. And I kind of just reversed it so that the migration is a push from D6, which is very stable. So I wrote a lot of the code that I'm gonna describe here was written in D6. And one of the things that also, for this migration, you're going from one similar system to another. So it's very easy to write SQL bulk inserts to move data. You have to transform the data, but you still are looking at, here's a menu table in Drupal 6, here's a, there's, okay, the truth is, here's a menu table in Drupal 6, and there's six menu tables in Drupal 8, but the data does map in some way. You can do a migration and transform it a little bit and get it to work. Um, and then the other big challenge, the big challenge and benefit is you have to rebuild your configuration, and. Um, in Drupal 6, I, I just wrote the YAML configuration files. I had some templates that I would export from Drupal 8. Um, the great thing about Symfony was it's very easy to pull Symfony code into Drupal 6. I just pulled down the YAML serializa um, serialization and parser. A and then this is, to migrate nodes, you have to serialize it. That was just my conclusion. Basically, you take the object that's in Drupal 6, serialize it, and then in Drupal 8, I opened it and brought it in using the normal entity API so that I made sure all the data was correct and stable. Um, so there, there's, the, after the migration, it's the challenge of getting the functionality. And definitely Drupal 8 has a lot of modules in core. There are just certain func views in core I think makes a big difference for a lot of people, but there's little subtle changes. Um, big one that came to mind was like the menu block module got brought into core. That's just a, a module that allows you to parse your menu in different ways to pull little pieces out. And that's a key requirement for most websites now is you want to just show the first and second level or the second and third level of your navigation. Um, so that helped a lot, but then it, there was a reality that when we started in Alpha 3, there was no module for that. Like any functionality we wanted had to be custom. Um, it, that gradually changed as people started catching up and some modules were brought over. Um, I'm only gonna talk about one module that I had to address and it's web forms. And I think web forms is still in a state of uncertainty. Um, there was, th they're still working on that module, so we had to come up with a solution. And I kind of took, I looked at the problem and tried to come up with the simplest solution to the problem. And what I came up with was 
one of the most complex things of web forms or most of the code is the UI admin interface to have all those fields and drag and drop them and control them. And I stripped it down to just a YAML file that represents a form. And I also kind of brought things back to the form, AP, form API instead of putting a layer in front of it. You basic, uh, I'm gonna show an example, but basically it's a render array. It takes the form render array, dumps it into a YAML, and someone can edit it. It's readable, and every developer is familiar with it, and the content editors have gradually come around to what render arrays are and understand the hack before it. Um, and once you have the form, it's, it's, it's really what Web Forms is doing is just CRUD. It's just saving data. It depends on what direction Web Forms is gonna go in, but if you just wanna collect data, it's just inserting it into a table and then exporting it into a spreadsheet. Um, and then the final piece is send mail, which is a pretty simple one. Um, and one funny thing about that migration I talked about with the pushing from Drupal 6, it was incredibly easy to migrate 200 web forms with like hundreds of fields from Drupal 6 to Drupal 8 because the migration was in Drupal 6. It was able to use the web form API, build the form, and then just serialize it to YAML. So I didn't have to write a lot of custom migration to get these forms over because I was kind of leveraging existing code. And, and the truth is my existing knowledge of Drupal 6, which kind of shifted over to Drupal 8. Um, and this is really the example of the um, UI. It's really simple. <laughs> this is the form over here that builds this. Um, this is the YAML that's used to build the form on the right. It's, if you're a developer, you're very familiar with this syntax. If you're not, it's basically just a bunch of properties and it collects it. And then there's settings to kind of set up the confirmation page. Um, we're gonna do a boff about this form. I, I think it's also just the future survey forms in Drupal 8 and 9. Um, there's gotta be a better solution or a long-term solution for it so that in future versions of Drupal, we don't have to do custom code for it. Um, and I'm gonna hand it off to Jonathan, because I mean, the other thing besides doing custom code was the chasing head was running into core issues. And we definitely queued, like as I started moving along, there were little subtle issues in core that needed to be addressed. And yeah, when Jonathan came on, we <laughs> I handed him a list of 10 things that were just not working, and he had to go through them and, and resolve them. Um, I'm gonna hand it off to you so you can. Yeah, so um, like Jake said, this project started on Alpha 3 in 2013. So by the time I came on to the project in October, which I think was like beta four or five, there was quite a stack of issues that they had been piling up um, waiting. And uh, you know, one of the great opportunities when you're working on a project, like a real actual project during this level of um, you know the phase of core development is um, not only do you have the opportunity to fix clear and broken bugs, but you have the opportunity to fundamentally change core um, to make the fix make sense instead of, you know, if you wait for a release candidate or, um, you know, final release, um, really major bugs are essentially just sort of band-aided over. You're not going to be able to change underlying APIs um, to enable the system to make more sense. Um, so that was, um, you know, really great. Since um, October, we have committed 57, like directly contributed 57 patches that have been committed. Um, we've submitted dozens more that, you know, are still waiting for review and um, many, many dozens more of patches that we didn't actually write, but we reviewed and moved along to RTPC and eventually being committed. And then in addition to that, literally hundreds and hundreds of long neglected issues, um, some sitting around for as long as four years that need review. Um, we reduced at one point that number to, I think, four months. Um, and I started coming back on myself where I was the last person to comment. So, you know, that number has grown back to six months that needs review, I think, is the oldest. Um, you know, so just sort of moving Drupal 8 along, um, working directly on issues that MSK was running into, but also issues that they hadn't run into yet or issues that would unblock the final release was you know, one of the big roles I played on this project. Um, another really great opportunity at this stage of core development is there's other agencies and developers working on um, you know, Drupal 8 projects for clients. And you have a way to, um, you know, at this, at this stage, there's more of an opportunity to collaborate with them uh, because 
Um, you know, it's not as finalized of an API as something like Drupal 7, where you know if you run into a core bug on Drupal 7, you know there might be an issue too about it. Um, but you don't really, you know, go out and ping another developer working on core because they've already had their say, or it's too late to do it. Whereas on this project, um, there were several different developers from several different agencies that. Um, we worked with regularly, both on core issues and on contrib, um, collaborating, you know, trading off on, on issues to sort of get them uh, committed and fixed. Um, in the contrib space, we directly um, contributed patches to upgrade these nine modules. Um, that is the sum total of contrib modules we're running on this site. The, the Drupal 6 site had 114 contrib. This site has nine, and it's not, there is quite a bit of custom code to make up that difference, but a big part of it is, like Jake said, Drupal 8 does a lot more. The custom code for Drupal 8, you can do a lot more with a lot less, so, you know, his YAML form module, I think, is 6,000 lines of code, and I think web form in Drupal 7 is 50 plus thousand lines of code. Um, So like I said, 57 patches have been directly contributed and committed. There's a bunch more. Um, Ryan Aslett, uh, AKA Mixologic, who works for the DA, gave me a very interesting statistic. He said the average issue when you, you know, submit a patch and move it to needs review sits for 23 days before anybody does anything, and that's the average. Um, so there's obviously a lot of opportunity for more people to participate um, and help move Drupal 8 forward. Um, you know, the issue queue can be a scary place. The critical issues that are left that are sort of blocking a release candidate are really big and complex, and, you know, I wouldn't recommend that for a beginner, but there's plenty of minor and normal. Uh, even some of the major tasks are pretty easy to jump in. Um, you know, if you're not a coder, there's a tag that's called needs manual review. You can, you know, go and search for that tag, and it usually explains how to reproduce the issue. You can spin up a um, simply test me, so you don't even need to run it locally. It'll build Drupal 8 with the patch applied. You can repeat the steps. If it works, you're saying, you can say, this is good. It passes manual testing. If it's not, you can set it to needs work. Um, part of the, you know, the core issues that they'd sort of stacked up were blocking you know, the front end work that needed to be done. Um, so you know, moving SASE, which is the sort of new uh, underlying theme for Drupal 8, um, I helped unblock some of those issues. Um, and, you know, by doing that, that helped, you know, make Drupal 8 more conducive for the approach that, um, you know, this front end and the design uh, that they were going to use for this site. Um, it, it, Drupal 8 made it much more easier than uh, Drupal, it would have been in Drupal 7. So to talk more about that, I'm going to turn it over to Brad Wade and Jill Baker. Good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is uh, Jill Baker, and uh, I'm a principal creative engineer at Digitas LDI. Uh, just a few words about Digitas. There are a few of us in the audience here, I think. <laughs> we are um, a global agency that does uh, all types of work, not just front end. Um, and so on this site, like Evan mentioned earlier, we were responsible for some content strategy for um, a lot of the design work, user experience, uh, and then the front end build as well. Um, so one unique thing about uh, this site in terms of how we built it is um, we built it as a uh, standalone prototype app. And uh, as Jonathan was alluding to, um, Drupal 8, I think, gave us the flexibility that we needed in order to accomplish that. So. Um, with Digitas only being responsible for the front end of the site, uh, it's actually sort of unique in that I and uh, the other developers on the team actually didn't need to have Drupal expertise. We were just building a modern, flexible, responsive front end that was then integrated piecemeal uh, through an agile workflow. Um, so one of the things that uh, we do along with our site builds is um, Not 
changing slides. <laughs> so one of the things that we do a lot with our site builds is build these living reference pages. Um, and I think this was instructive in terms of the actual integration when it came to that point in the process. So uh, they're sort of thrown in here, so forgive the presentation. But um, we create a living style guide, which you can see an example of on the upper right there, where you're seeing actually a representation of some of the major styles on the site, in this case, the color palette. And actually here we're showing the uh, SAS variable names and their resulting hex values as well. Um, so that full style guide contains other things like basic global element styles, uh, some global utility classes that you can use, et cetera. We also create an icon library, which you're seeing in the upper left there. We use uh, IcoMoon for custom icon fonts for cross-browser vector rendering of iconography. And so as we add new items to that font, we represent those there and also include the class names that are used to uh, represent them in the code. And then on the bottom left and bottom right here, you're seeing examples of container library pages or component library pages. And we use those to display each component as we build it. We do build everything in a component style rather than a page style. And then we also represent here any variants of that component. So for instance, if you have a quote that either has an image background or it doesn't, if you have a table that needs to have one presentation versus another, we would represent all of those here and also include uh, the component name, which you're seeing there, icon feature text in this case, uh, and also any instructional notes on their use. So these pages serve as a reference for the client, for designers, for the UX team as they review, and also for front-end developers as they got onboarded to the team uh, and continue and maintain code standards as the project progresses. One thing you can also notice here is uh, there's a switch theme to section. Uh, this site had three major segment themes and um, we built this little theme switcher essentially so that on the prototype you could just use a, a URL parameter to test by swapping the entire container library page into that other theme um, by a body class. So the front end prototype site architecture was initially based off of our in-house Yeoman site generator, which we call Starter Kit. Um, this architecture leverages Assemble as a static site generator and uh, is used for handlebars rendering for JavaScript templating. If you're not familiar with Yeoman or Assemble, uh, I highly recommend them for spinning up modern sites very quickly. It lets you focus on the hard and interesting problems and not resolve the same uh, sort of base problems over and over again. Uh, and you can also use Yeoman for many other common systems and patterns. You know, in this case, we were using it with Front and Assemble and so forth, but you can use it for React, Angular, what have you. We're using both NPM and Bower for dependency management, uh, such as LibSAS for SAS compilation. And as I mentioned, we use Grunt as our primary build task manager, um, even though some people in-house are trying Gulp out now as well for tasks such as live reload, JS linting, SAS compilation, auto prefixing, minification, and others. So I'm just gonna run through very quickly some of the third party libraries and plugins that we used. Um, you can review the slides on your own time if you're interested in any of them. Um, we did use jQuery very heavily as well as bits from jQuery UI such as the tab control. Um, we also use parts of Twitter Bootstrap via the Bootstrap SAS implementation. Um, if you're not familiar with the Bootstrap SAS implementation, it's actually really powerful because one of the weaknesses of Bootstrap is that it's sort of a monstrosity. There's so many pieces to it, it can get very heavy. And often you find yourself just reskinning every piece anyway and essentially writing duplicate code instead of writing your code once. So with Bootstrap SAS, you can actually override their SAS variables instead of overriding each resulting style declaration. So you change one value and Bootstrap itself will be generated with the appropriate styles rather than overriding them individually. Um, you can also leverage their built-in mix-ins, et cetera. Uh, we also use the picture fill library to polyfill the current browser implementations of the W3C responsive image spec. Um, so in that way, we were able to use uh, the modern standard and then picture fill just uh, fills in the gaps for those browsers as that support uh, continues. Um, others to highlight, Owl Carousel we're using. Um, if you ever get asked to build a carousel that has that peak effect at the sides, highly recommend Owl Carousel. It's hard to search for, but <laughs> it can do it. It's called stage padding. Uh, JPush menu for off-canvas navigation, sticky JS for a custom sticky sidebar behavior. Uh, we use chosen for select element styling and uh, inquire for media queries in JavaScript. 
In terms of browser compatibility, we were tasked with supporting IE8 and higher in addition to all other major browsers and a set of particular mobile devices and operating systems as well. We used IE conditional comments to serve a slightly different HTML element with a class that was targeted to those browsers. And we also leveraged the following Grimp build tasks. Uh, StripMQ to serve queryless CSS, uh, despite our CSS being written mobile first um, to, to unsupporting browsers. Modernizer for general feature detection. Bless CSS for avoiding um, little known IE limits on number of selectors and rules in a given file. And auto prefixer to automatically add browser specific CSS pref prefixes. So similarly to using Yeoman to kind of do the initial setup and kind of cut out some of the common repeatable tasks, um, these tasks are great because they happen um, live as you're developing, they happen on build automatically, so developers don't have to worry about, you know, checking can I use for the latest uh, browser prefixes needed based on our support mat matrix. Um, Bless CSS automatically chops your files into chunks that IE can handle and you can serve those only to IE, et cetera. So this is just a quote from our internal starter kit documentation um, regarding the principles behind our component-based architecture. And so for us, a component is a small package of front-end software that does only one thing, and it does it well. A component should include all the appropriate pieces it needs to do its job, but no more and no less. Essentially, all items that we build are built as independently as possible to allow for <coughs> maximum flexibility on the front end. Uh, a window shade is still a window shade regardless of what page it appears on. So our architecture involved a few different layouts which were nestable one inside the other to avoid duplicative code. Um, we're able to share pieces of a template such as the standard set of CSS and script imports as separate handlebars partials so that we can repeat them across pages without literally repeating the code. Each component is at least one handlebars file and then optionally SAS, JavaScript, and JSON for uh, styling, scripting, and data respectively. We do use the BEM syntax. I think there's another talk today about that, so I'm gonna definitely go to that one. Uh, for our class nomenclature for easy identification of components and their subparts, uh, avoidance of specificity issues, and standardized ways of handling variants in our code. Each item can stand alone, as is represented in our component libraries, but it can also be affected by the context in which it is placed. We feed data into each page and component via inline first JSON helpers, external JSON files, and page YAML headers. Often components are written with default content so that developers don't have to add unique content every time they need to throw it into a page to mock it up, but we make it overridable so that unique content can be added if, if needed for that page. As you can see, despite it being only a front-end static site, uh, we use very modern and effective tools and workflow to achieve a highly flexible and maintainable as well as user-friendly site. The component architecture is one way in which we hope to make the lives of our back-end counterparts easier and help to maintain the fidelity of the design as it was translated to become operable. Um, Brad Wade of Phase 2 and I worked very closely together to ensure that our code worked well in tandem and that our deliverables were meeting their needs. Hi, so I'm, I'm Brad Wade from Phase 2, and my job on this project was to try to integrate all this code and work that uh, Digisauce did in creating this prototype, because believe it or not, we didn't want to have to redo everything she just described in Drupal, so we wanted to be able to leverage um, what they had already done, and um, uh, the prototype, the standalone prototype was being developed and created and approved at the same time as we were doing the, the Drupal uh, build. So um, these were happening in parallel. Um, so we needed to integrate their code in and we needed to do it continuously and regularly and over and over again. Uh, so we wanted to be able to automate as much as this process of integrating their, uh, what they've done, uh, as much automate as much as we could. So what I did was I wrote some grunt autom automation to build out their prototype, to build the static, their static version of it, um, and then to copy over various assets from it, to copy over the custom JavaScript, the custom CSS, the icons, the videos, the images. Um, so we have the assets, move, we move the assets over using the Scrum automation into the Drupal theme, um, and then we had to do some, one, some, 
some uh, setup of the Drupal theme, basically one-time setup of making the theme aware of where are these assets and which ones are we using, which ones are we not. Here's, the, here's where the CSS is, here's where the JavaScript is. And then we uh, took some time to evaluate the libraries, all that list of libraries that Jill showed you. Um, she, she mentioned how she was using jQuery. Drupal uses jQuery. So we took some time to, to see, well, can we use this same library? Can we just say, okay, we're gonna depend on Drupal core jQuery, which we did do. Uh, they also use Modernizer, but um, their Modernizer was more verbose, provided more class names that they were keying off of in their CSS. So instead of using core Modernizer, we you know, elected to include Digitas's uh, version of Modernizer in, 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 uh, in the theme, in the Drupal theme. Um, so we had that set up, but we did have to write a small amount of uh, CSS and JavaScript just to kind of make it work, some glue JavaScript and some, uh, and some CSS to account for a few use cases uh, that the prototype wasn't aware of that happened in Drupal. But, but the good news is we, we did wind up being able to use like 90%, you know, was just came through just fine, and it was just this, the, you know, over 90%, just some small use cases that we had to account for what we called these, this Drupal compatibility layer to make it all work. Um, so, so now we had the assets, this JavaScript and CSS ready to go, but of course it was expecting a certain kind of markup. It was expecting the markup that they had in the prototype. So this is where the, work, the, you know, the hard work of integration came in of, of our making Drupal's output, their markup match this, this prototype. Um, and so we took these three approaches to do that. The, uh, our main MO was to go in, override the twig templates, and, and just have them match what uh, was expected. So um, we take, take one of those components uh, from, the, uh, from the prototype. We take a look at it. Um, so we would take a look at, 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 at one of their components, which would use handlebar templates using variables that were defined in JSON. Um, so that was what was happening in the prototype. Over in Drupal land, we were using twig templates with variables uh, you know, that, that came from fields in, in the Drupal database. Um, and we would, we would basically recreate those templates and you know, go, go from the handlebar style to twig. Um, and um, so working with Twig in Drupal 8 was, was great, and especially as I was just, uh, uh, it, Twig has a sh easy, gentle learning curve. P everyone, you know, everyone was able to pick it up quickly and enjoyed working with it. Um, it was also, it's, it's very much like handlebars or mustache, you know, uh, some of the modern templating languages. So there was a ton of similarity between the style of uh, templating that was going on between the prototype and Drupal. Um, the, the templates themselves didn't exactly overlap in the same in the same way because there there's nested layouts um, and and the, the nesting assumptions were different in each. So th these weren't one to one uh, correspondences in the templates, but but the the uh, templating languages themselves were very similar, um, uh, which is which which is nice that Drupal is using something that's more can be more normal and accessible to general front end people out there, they'll see these twig templates and they'll say, oh, hey, this is my world, I know what's going on here. Um, so that was our normal uh, main way that we did it, but sometimes we did work ahead and cooperate uh, with Digitas and said, you know, there are some places where we just want to send you some markup and uh, could you guys style this instead? You know, we took, we took Drupal's form output and we said, hey, can you guys just style this, uh, you know, use this markup instead of your just ideal markup that you'd normally use. Um, so we did that sometimes to speed up the process to, uh, you know, make there be less overall work to make deadlines. And, um, and th but that, that, that's a viable option as well. In your prototype, put what, you know, Drupal's already going to do. And that, that might be a, a good decision for, for people in their projects. And we use both approaches. So the third thing we did was, well, we, we, had, we had this problem, a common problem, that we wanted to have some rich widgets, containers, components uh, that, w that would require rich, complex markup. We wanted those to appear inside the body content of a Drupal node. 
um, inside that field that's usually governed by a content editor entering text into a WYSIWYG. We wanted some of these really, within that, some rich widgets. Um, so how are we gonna do that? So Jake had a vision and uh, created a custom module uh, that allowed editors to enter some simple markup with a special class name, and then Drupal would filter through that the body field and, and find those little code snippets, transform them into more complex markup, um, and to, in order to produce these widgets that we needed. So, um, for example, for, for, for a, a quote, a pull quote, a content editor could come in and enter, wrap the quote text in, in a div with a special class name, and there's a little extra data there defined in a data attribute. Um, and then this simple markup would get run through a template that you know gets transformed using a template like this with much more complex markup in order to produce you know, a beautiful stylized inline quote inside the body field um, that looks like this here um, on the left. Some of that extra data that I s mentioned was actually a reference to a user ID that went out and grabbed and was able to grab the, the username and the title to attribute the quote there at the bottom. Um, so an advantage to this approach um, is that, uh, that, that that complex markup that we looked at isn't saved in the database in your body field in line in there. Um, and, and that way in the future when you wanna make a change to how it's output or a change to the style or you redesign or when you're moving to Drupal 9, um, you don't have to like you know, have this, you're not wedded to that exact markup. Um, you, you can change that at a, at a later time. Um, so we, we started with this idea, I, I think just to sort of meet this use case. Um, but then, but then uh, later in the project, we decided to, uh, well, extend this concept a little further to achieve what we called the tile template layout. Um, so, uh, we, here we, you would see some, uh, some divs with uh, these brackets referring to different nodes, uh, node IDs defined in brackets inside, you know, wrapped in some divs. And um, th this relatively, relatively simple markup uh, was able to produce this much more complex, beautiful layout that, that you see here. Um, and uh, we're gonna talk more about this tile template now. Awesome, thanks Brad. Um, so um, we just wanted to have a little bit of a discussion about the tile template specifically um, because it kind of represents a lot of things that um, we've already discussed in the project. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of ask a couple questions and kind of get kick us off and then we'll sort of open it up to audience in a little bit. Um, so to kind of start us off, um, Evan, um, I know the tile template's one of your favorite parts of the site um, and that it kind of um, in our agile design process sort of came up towards the end as we were approaching, um, you know, final push. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about more about like the site motif standpoint, why the tile templates are so essential and how they allow your team to really maximize and display content. Yeah, sure. So um, as Molly said, the tile template is by far uh, my absolute favorite template on the website. Um, and it really comes from this position that we have where, you know, we have 30, 25, 30,000 nodes and um, we need to display a lot of teasers um, just to invite people in um, and, you know, really having a, a simple approach and very focused as we've, as we've attempted to do on many of our other templates, we felt that the tile template offers the, the best view to um, show many different pages that are deep down within the site um, that people can access quickly and they can just scroll through and, and, and pick what uh, pick what they need to get to. Um, but, um, you, know, as, you know, Molly also mentioned that we were stressed for time and so the, the you know, in, within this agile process, um, and the plan was to go live in April and this design was approved mid-March. Um, and as we began to talk about that design with Brad and, and, and the rest of the front end team at phase two, um, we, we put an estimate at about uh, four weeks of work to implement all the tile templates. And so we had many variations of this tile template. Um, I think there's, uh, there's probably like four or five of them. Um, and so that became an issue for timing. And then, well, I think 
mean, you want to talk about the API? Well, uh, I mean, I, sorry, I got to move the first one. Um, that, that API, I mean, the key thing there is com componentizing the front end of your website. That was the, the most successful aspect of that code package for me was there was a page that broke down every single widget that had to be built and gave you the markup to exactly what needed to be done. And the, the tile template, once the API was written, which I, I will throw out that core made it much easier to write an API where, okay, here's a, here's a class that just processes HTML and parses HTML. Even the parsing of HTML in court is just easier. There's some more utility. Um, but to be able to have this, this static markup that just said, this is the HTML you need, I literally took that HTML, put it into a file, marked it original. Then I wrote the twig template, which, you know, and matched up every, every single component just has a, there's actually a dedicated page for every single component you see on that tile template where you can just see the markup working, and then you can see the basic markup. It also gave documentation for the content editors. Um, that, I mean, the, the key thing to walk, the key takeaway is this whole component system for the front end, which is there's at least two sessions dedicated to it. I feel like in nine, in Drupal 9, it's going to become the norm um, with the theme, theme layout. Yeah, um. I just want to also add that it really it helped to accelerate the project because, you know, like I said, we were looking at 20 days and we knocked it down to less than five. So it, you know, that's what got us. You know, this method really got us to launch you know, when we were first on time. So. Yeah, and just to follow up on the component-based um, discussion, I mean, that's been such a key part of like the work that you guys did on the front end. Um, so I'm wondering, Jill, if you could talk a little bit more about how the component process sort of fed into the tile templates because there were so many different variations and how you guys worked together. So basically the, the component approach, um, so in this case, as I mentioned, we're, we're using the um, components for many types of pages and to a designer, um, having something in a grid with flexible widths and totally different things within each cell is a template um, to us, not so much. Uh, so basically what we did is we defined every variant of these different types of tiles that could be placed within a grid and then we sort of extract the, the two separate pieces, the layout and then the tiles themselves. Uh, so the layout we just built to be flexible where you could say, you know, this is a two column versus four column versus six column type of uh, grid. And then within that, you could basically, in theory, plop these tiles of various types. Um, and you know, you saw a little bit there, but we're using them for things as disparate as bios and location pages and um, other types of featured content. And so to do that, we needed a lot of different ways to, to stylize and display that content. So in some cases, those tiles would be text only. In some cases, they'd have a lot of text, so they'd need a different treatment. Uh, where we introduced sort of a read more behavior within that component. Um, many of them included images, et cetera. So lots of different variants to choose from. And as Jake mentioned, uh, we tried to display every single one of them in one page as a comprehensive reference. Um, and the read more bit is actually, I feel like, a success story as well, where um, as soon as we saw the design on the front end, we reached out and said, you know, this is sort of how we're thinking about implementing this piece. Does that actually even make sense with Drupal? You know, it's going to require the DOM to be in a little bit different order than you might expect. And so we were able to just quickly prototype that out on the front end and then verify those expectations um, with phase two. And I think, you know, we ended it in a, a really good result based on that. Uh, maybe Brad. Yeah. Um, I just want to tan tangent off of that. Because Digitas was creating specific components using the, the BEM class naming um, methodology, uh, when we were matching the markup, <coughs> we were careful to get each component re right and, and to get each component very uh, precise. But we didn't actually have to m match all of the markup on the page entirely. Um, because those, those components are reusable and you can put them here and there, move them around, we, ha we have some extra like Legion wrappers around there that don't show up in the prototype. And um, so, if it, with these reusable components, there is a little bit of flexibility to the overall entire markup of the page, and that's a big advantage of being using a good methodology like BEM and doing this component-based design. Great. Um, so one more question on this topic. Um, I know that the, um, the team has already spoken about how it was Drupal 8 really um, allowed this to happen much more easily than would have been able to happen in the past. And I know, Jonathan, you've been working kind of deeply in Drupal 8 and Drupal 8 core, and I was wondering if there's any other things that kind of um, Drupal 8's 
accelerated in the, co in the course of this um, project. Yeah, I mean, I think the, it, we've touched on it a bit, but the, just the ability to do much more with much less boilerplate in much more concise ways, like Jake said, you just have a one class for one thing where you extend you know, a core class that does 99% of what you need it and just overrides a one method that you know if you want to do it a little differently. Or um, you know, in some cases, I think in the book, uh, the book module case, the you know the core book manager just wasn't doing enough or as much. Um, so in Drupal 8, instead of writing some crazy patch or you know hacking around, um, you can just swap out the service and make it do as long as you implement the interface, make it do exactly what you want. Um, you know, and that just that theme just kept coming up over and over. Whether we were talking about custom code in the YAML form module or you know porting contrib modules. Um, you know, like I said earlier, we ported or helped port nine contrib modules, uh, which you know normally in a Drupal seven I wouldn't really recommend as part of a project because it's so the most is absolutely crucial. But you know, the, just the time involved in trying to port um, things from six to seven, for instance, it you know it's much much easier now. Great. Um, so one last question before I turn it over to audience questions. Um, so, you know, if we were to do stuff again, um, you know, would we, would we do things differently? And this is a question for Jake, because I know that you were around since the very beginning. Um, and just thought maybe you had Thank some you. insight. Um, this is great. Um, I, I mean, I think I, I, my conclusion on this project is like the whole notion of headless Drupal, I, I see a lot of merit with it. it, it it's also like we're talking about components, like taking complex things and making them simpler. And one of the concepts of headless Drupal is just like take the front end, which is really complex, and move it over here, and take the back end and move it over there. And it might make it easier for people to manage their websites. I mean, the other selling point which we are struggling with is if you separate the two, you could actually upgrade your back end and not upgrade your front end, or do the other way around, because they're separate and independent things. And one of the struggles with Drupal is you have a lot of things going on in one place, and it's hard to figure out how to move forward to the next version of Drupal. Um, so th that was my takeaway, and I, I honestly see there's more opportunities ahead even with this project board. Headless Drupal are just breaking things down into simpler components or simp like taking functionality and isolating it into maybe sometimes a symphony library, literally just building symphony code to deal with something that is very specific custom code. Um, yeah, and uh, speaking of that, I know we'll, we'll be doing a boff. Um, a little bit later on um, the form approach. So just a little bit of a shout out to that. Um, and uh, let's move on to um, audience questions. So we have this mic up here, and we're going to move it back there. Um, so yeah, please, um, when we get the mic up, we'd love to hear your questions. So my burning question, because it's part of my life, how have you and will you manage core updates now? And how do you move the content once you do? So we've been talking a little bit about this. Um, I think this is a good question for maybe Jake and Jonathan to sort of tag team. Hi. No, no, no. Um, we haven't had the full discussion. I mean, the, the simplest thing, uh, th there's basically two challenges. It's moving config and data. Well, no. it's configuration, data, and custom code. And I think those are going to be three tracks in the upgrade path that we're going to address. And I think the good part that Jonathan's kind of focused on core, I think he's going to be able to handle data and config pretty well because he's aware of it. And and I actually, and the custom code, because I have tests, I mean, tests are essential. I can't even, I mean, I've got, you know, 50 different test suites running. Every single version, every test broke. I, it just because there, and, and you really there's simple API changes and you just got to go through the change record and catch it. Um, and I think we're going to have a pain point in, we're on beta 7. We're going to run into a major pain point from beta 7 to catch up and hopefully when they have the upgrade path that will solve a lot of the problems. And it's important to say we don't, at right now there's no critical thing that needs we need to upgrade. So we're going to hold off until we actually need to. Yeah, and you know, so the site is on beta seven, um, which is a little misleading because beta eight and nine were essentially the same release that just came out four hours apart. <coughs> so they're really, and then beta ten came out at the end of April. So it's really two betas behind. And um, one really big thing that happened from beta nine to beta ten 
uh, while there's still not an official upgrade path, the, uh, it's called the head-to-head -head module, which was big um, in er early adoption of Drupal 7, which was sort of facilitated unofficial upgrade paths from each version of alpha uh, for 7. And so that has been revised for Drupal 8. Um, one of the really big changes that happened between beta, um, beta 8 and sort of beta 9 and 10 was they removed um, the taxonomy uh, term field just sort of a fancy decorated entity term reference or entity reference field you know and that is a, that's just like has hundreds of terms or many yeah. different you know dozens of different fields so we don't have to address that um, from scratch there's an example hopefully maybe it just works in the head-to-head -head module so even even though that's not in core and sort of officially blessed as an upgrade path it is you know it will serve as as our guide I'll just add, like, th with core, there's certain moments where you just have to have a leap of fa faith that you'll figure it out. I mean, even with config management, we features isn't available. And I'm doing core man config management, and actually core works really well. It's two lines of code to have a YAML config file and bring it into core. You just have to know you need to bring in that file. And um, I think with the upgrade path, that's what's going to happen. We're going to run into issues and just resolve them. I wanted to ask a question about workflow. Um, if you had to do custom coding for that, or if you had workflow built into the content sure. So yeah. just a quick shout out. We have Toby Hagler, who is also on the project in the front row. He worked a lot on that, and Mike Ledoux as well. Um, but Jonathan, do you want to take this one? Yeah, so um, that's actually one of my favorite patches to core that wasn't committed, and it probably won't because it's a really big feature addition. Um, one of the great things about 8 is all of the underlying functionality and APIs necessary for complex workflows are in place. There's just no UI for it. So, um, you know, one of the patches that Jake set me loose on was to go and make a UI for actually moderating the meeting. And um, that patch is out there waiting for review. Um, it's been bumped to 8.1, which I agree with because it's a, you know, a good feature at this point, um, but it introduces, the patch itself is really just a module that adds UI, so, you know, maybe in the upcoming months, that might just get moved into core as sort of like the most fundamental workflow. Um, but, you know, more complex workflows like workbench moderation will be much simpler um, in, in eight, so I think you'll see some good modules upgraded more quickly than you've seen in previous versions of, in previous core releases. And I just have one one sort of point to sort of turn it to you guys is that um, the editorial team worked really closely on getting all the content ready, and they had a lot of you know were able to do a lot with the process of doing the content entry on the D6 side, and and are also working in D8. So maybe you guys could talk a little bit about how the team's working um, currently, and it seems like they've got a good handle on it. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, a lot of the or pretty much all the um, editorial. Um, work was done prior to the final migration, and so um, just working in D6 and, and having that ported over. Um, but now it's, you know, as far as as far as working um, with the admin view in, in D8, things, uh, things seem to be going pretty well, and fairly soon we'll have some adoption for the team. Um, I just want to also clarify, that, like, just because I think people are concerned about workflow, it's a very simple workflow. It's basically the idea of you just don't want revisions to go live. You just want to be able to stage them. And then the only other thing that, like, that's what Jonathan worked on. And the only other, and it was a really simple amount of code, is to be able to let someone view unpublished content that you're staging. And it was like setting up that permission and just allowing people to go to, you know, just let a doctor review their bio that's not published. And it, it core makes it very easy to do very simple access control rules. Not very rich ones. Like, just if you want someone to have a special rule to view a page, it's actually quite simple. There's a hook for it. Um, and that, that requirement made it very simple. We don't have a complex workflow. Awesome. Um, any more questions? I have one question. Um, what was the most challenging part of this project? And if you could do it again, what would you do differently? I'll, I'll pass this over quickly, but I just want to say the timeline. Um, and if we had more time, it, you know, that would, that would have been great. But Anyone else?
people in terms of, you know, obviously we're happy with the style of the thing like that. We just need to know that it was. And so we had to wait until we got a little bit farther along with the back end so that we could actually prototype out those features and get the results we want that. But, um, you know, once we did that, obviously made the integration piece piece much smoother for you, but we also on the front end didn't have to worry about, you know, features needing to be rewritten later based on integration requirements that we couldn't have predicted. Two sentences just to come out of it. Um, but when we very first started the site, um, a lot of stuff in the theme layer had changed. And so, you know, when I was going to do the simple things I've learned, you know, from Drupal 7 on, I went to do them and it's like, oh, that doesn't happen this way anymore. So, what do you do? I'll do a quick Google search and then find nothing because no documentation had been written yet. So it really helped me to understand how fantastic and how great what good documentation and documenting things is. And, and the documentation has gotten a lot better since then, but that was a really, that was really rough uh, uh, part of the project for me at the beginning and really encouraged me to help with the documentation process. So. Yeah, thanks, Rad. So it seems like some of the takeaways there are documentation, Always a good thing, um, but as another phase two, or Mai says, it's so hard <laughs> and um, needs review in core, right? Like, people should start hitting up those issues. Yeah, um, that was in, you know, in core, that was not necessarily difficult, but, well, yeah, difficult because the really, like, really critical issues get tons of reviews. Really simple issues, people can review. It's like sort of the medium issues, like the adding uh, views support for the date field. Uh, was one of the first patches I worked on on eight months ago. It's still sitting in needs review because it's just complicated enough that we and it's not squarely in support of views, so the views guys are you know, a little distant. So you know, to you know, do that differently, I would be more proactive about going up and actually saying, hey, we need to review this guy and make sure that they get the most differential from this region. It's <laughs> long lingering <laughs> patches. I know. I'll also add, um, Jonathan came in kind of halfway through the project, and I, 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 looking back, I think you should have someone dealing with core immediately through it. And maybe, you know, when we're starting, it was a lot of small issues, but it would be nice to have had those addressed. I mean, really stupid ones, like an argument didn't work properly in, oh, that one I actually patched where, like, arguments didn't work if they were more than 25 characters long, the field name or something. And, but it, it's good to kind of, if you have someone looking at core early and addressing these small things, it's good. It's good for the community because these little issues can just get taken out of the queue and then the bigger ones can kind of come to the forefront. Um, yeah, that would be my biggest, like make, I, I think if you're doing this type of project, you want someone on the core path immediately. Um, it just also just, Jonathan's kind of moving along with your project and when you run into an issue, he can hop in and he knows what's going on in core and he can hop back out and address it and it makes a big difference. It's a certain comfort level when I run deep Every single bug on the project, I was able to push it to him in core and be like, take a look at this. And very few were like, that's an incredible pickle that we can't solve. And sometimes we solved it with custom code, to be honest. We talked about it and we're like, no, let's just brute force custom code around the patch and wait until the community figures it out. Um, so I think that that's done. And I just wanted to see if Evan has anything to in closing. Um, yeah, sure. So, um, you know, just in closing, I, you know, I think that, you know, this was a, a huge undertaking. Um, and, it, you know, what, what this team did was, you know, really no, nothing short of remarkable. Um, it was a, a fantastic feat. And, um, you know, we, we, had, we were staffed with the right team and, and uh, you know, the right approach um, to core and, and front end and, and, and the back end. So we, um, we think that uh, we made a really fantastic decision. And um, we're really excited about Drupal 8 and, and the future of it and just, you know, Drupal in general. Thank oh, you. Oh, sorry, shameless plug. We're we're hiring. <laughs> <laughs> Come talk to me. Three developers. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for hearing about our adventures in Drupal 8, and hope everyone has an amazing uh, rest of their DrupalCon. Um, and yeah, go Drupal 8. <laughs>